So a question I often ask my college students in my meditation and mindfulness classes is, how many negative events does it take to make a bad day? People sometimes say one, sometimes two, most often three. This is an experience I think all of us recognize. Three events or less can create a negative mood that can hang on and color the entire day. But think about it, how much time in that day did those events really occupy? Supposing we overslept in the morning, we're rushing so we banged our head on the way out the door, and it got caught in a traffic jam which made us late for work. That's all over by 9 or 10 a.m., right? So a few moments of our day we experience as negative. What about the rest of the moments in that day? Or consider this. Is there sometimes a day in which nothing bad actually really happens to us? I think we all have days like that, but how many of us go through a day without finding a reason to suffer? <laughs> so just out of curiosity, can I ask the audience, how many of you experience worry, anxiety, stress, or some other form of suffering on a daily or almost daily basis? Okay. How many of us know that the things we're worried about or anxious about may never come to pass, but we can't seem to stop the process anyway, yeah. So is there anything we can do about this? It's worth considering that as far as we know, this is a problem that human beings above a certain age uh, are the only creatures on the earth that are prone to. All of the other creatures that share this planet, near as we can tell when they have enough to eat, shelter, and they're not actively hurting, seem relatively compared with their, uh, seem relatively happy with their lives. Consider a chipmunk. <laughs> Have you ever seen an unhappy chipmunk? <laughs> no, they're always running around, excitedly looking for the next bird feeder to clamber into. The only unhappy chipmunk I've ever seen was when I've seen one in the mouth of a cat. <laughs> so. Um, that's a moment of actual suffering, and there's little we can do about those kind of moments. But what about the rest of the moments? In a, even in a relatively short life that comes to a bad end, wouldn't most moments in a chipmunk's day be relatively okay, if not on the upside? The chipmunks seem to think so. But if we gave a chipmunk human consciousness, all of a sudden, it's, oh my God, I'm a prey species. I'm at the bottom of the food chain. Even if I don't get eaten in the next week or month, every couple months, I'm going to be giving birth to a litter of six new baby chipmunks who are mostly going to be eaten as soon as they come out of the nest. And then even if I live to my whole lifespan, what's the best I get? Three years? <laughs> if chipmunks thought like we did, they'd be miserable. <laughs> But they don't think like we do, and neither do children up to a certain age. Watch any kid, at least up to school age, and it, when they're not actively hurting, I'm talking about a kid who's got everything they need, is loved and well-fed, they're excited about this moment and the next moment and the moment after that. So what is it that afflicts we adult human beings that the rest of the uh, animals and plants, even plants that share this earth, don't seem to be afflicted by? I want to share with you a system of understanding this problem. It's a 2,500-year-old model that I've adapted from the Zen tradition, which I've studied for the last 30 years, into something understandable and usable for the 21st century. And my students have found it very, very useful. This system is sometimes translated as the five conditions. It's called that because it has to do with our conditioning. It's a simple model of a mental and emotional process that uh, begins with a direct experience of reality, but pretty quickly runs kind of amok. So let me ask you all, what does actual reality consist of? I'm not asking for a conceptual uh, answer here, but will somebody tell me what actual reality consists of? Sensory, Sensory experience right now. Uh, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. I see you, you see me. You're hearing my words. We have some physical experience of being in our bodies, the temperature of the room, et cetera. That's about it. Actual reality is actually pretty simple. 
that's what chipmunks and kids live in, and that's why they seem relatively content with their lives. It's we grown-up humans that complicate matters, and that's what the five conditions model attempts to explain. So it's a chain of five steps, and the first step is sensation, actual reality. The second link, according to this model, is feeling. This doesn't mean complex emotional feeling. It means the simple sense of like or dislike, or there's a variety of neutral sensations that are kind of like the mood colored to our experience that we all have. It's the way you feel to be you right now. But the ones that we tend to notice are positive and negative. And this model says that every bit of sensory information that comes into us provokes such a reaction, some, some kind of feeling in us. For our purposes, positive and negative, like and dislike, are the most important things. So feeling. The third link in the chain is called reaction. The usual human reaction is to reach towards something we have a positive feeling for and pull away from something that we don't like. So let me give an example. You touch a hot stove. The actual experience is only the sensation of, of touch, heat, maybe a little bit of pain, maybe a lot of pain. <laughs> uh, a sensation comes into your awareness. You have an immediate feeling of dislike. And you pull your hand away. That's the reaction. Perhaps you shout. And also, the reaction phase includes complex emotion, like anger or fear. So perhaps you feel a flash of anger if you touch a hot stove. That's part of the reaction. So these first three links in the chain of the five conditions are also shared by animals and maybe even plants. If you think about it, plants somehow know where the position of the sun is. They somehow sense that this is a positive thing and they'll slowly turn to face the light, right? The fourth link in the chain is where it starts to get interesting. And this is where we start to enter the purely human realm. This is where our mind catches up with what we've just experienced. And we all know how this works. You may touch a hot stove, dislike it, react, and only then does the mind realize what's happened and apply a simple explanation to it. Oh, ouch, I touched a hot stove, right? But the fifth level in the chain, this is where the problems start. This is where the mind downloads everything that it knows about hot stoves, what idiot might have left the burner on, who manufactured this thing anyway, is it faulty, should they be sued, should it be replaced, maybe it's obsolete. An obsolete device like a, like a stove can cause a fire and fires can be very dangerous. I remember that fire at Aunt Mary's house just two years ago, burned everything she had, she barely got out alive. Poor Aunt Mary never did a thing to harm anyone. Why is life so cruel? <laughs> So do you see what the mind just did through its marvelous capacity to apply an explanation or to build a story around our experience? It's taken a simple, direct sensory experience and turned it into something a lot more complicated. We might not even develop a blister from the incident of the stove, but all of a sudden we're on to the pain of life and cruelty of life, and what on earth are we going to do about poor Aunt Mary? <laughs> So I'm a storyteller by trade. I'm a novelist and author, and I'm not here to tell us that our stories are bad. I love stories, and they serve both positive and negative functions in our lives. But when we have unexamined stories that, that are operating on automatic, and we entangle them with our understanding of reality, and this is something we all do to some extent, uh, they can cause, it can cause very big problems. So let me ask you all again. This is a story I believe we've probably all told ourselves. How many people have had the experience of passing a coworker or an acquaintance? Maybe it happened out here in the lobby, and somebody gave you a funny look, and you thought it meant they didn't like you or you'd done something wrong. How many people have had that experience? OK, how many people later found out that it wasn't true at all? That, in fact, maybe they like you an awful lot. They're just feeling shy and afraid to approach you. Or maybe they're intimidated by you, and they admire you, and they don't know what to say. Or maybe something else entirely is going on in their mind. Their dog died that morning. We don't know, do we? So this is an example of how the mind imposes the, uh, the stories that we carry on, on, on otherwise objective experience. 
and almost immediately obscures what's really happening. So what's the cure to this? Meditation practice in which we let go of our story again and again and return to direct experience, often by choosing an anchor such as the breath, is a great tool for learning to not believe everything we think, which is the motto of my Sage Institute program, <laughs> and, uh, and to gain a more objective view on our stories. And it's important to realize that most of our stories are, uh, that run on automatic, we never even chose to be there. They came in through what we learned as children, through our upbringing, through our learning, through our society and culture, our language. Um, so, and unexamined stories with, that are confused with reality can be very dangerous. Isn't that the root of ideology and fundamentalism? These can, uh, unexamined stories can be a central cause to some of the big problems we have in our society right now, the, the epidemic that we see of depression, anxiety, and stress-related illness, but also uh, the uh, ecological and other social problems that we face, as well as our own personal unhappiness. Uh, they can even start wars. So mindfulness is the active form of meditation, and whether or not we practice meditation, we can apply this to our lives. So for instance, we can perhaps notice when a negative feeling comes up in response to something, and we can interrupt uh, a blind reaction or a damaging reaction and turn it into an uh, effective response. We can foster more positive interpretations. And we can certainly stop the download of a story that might be damaging and cause trouble to ourselves and those people around us. Of course, practicing meditation makes the tool of mindfulness much easier to acquire and develop. So the one thing I tell my college students who come to me for a semester of meditation and mindfulness training is that I want them to leave my class with an understanding of the difference between reality and their stories about reality and the ability to do something about it. That's the same thing I want you to leave this talk with. A good starting point is to ask yourself the next time you find yourself worrying, anxious, or in some form of mental or emotional suffering, is there anything actually bad happening to me right now? Now, sometimes there is. Sometimes we've had a string of bad things. Sometimes we're in a crisis. So uh, I'm not denying that sometimes we really do have a bad day. But much, or even most of the time, the cause isn't that at all. It's that we're caught in a story, and we're running it without realizing it's running itself on automatic. When this happens too frequently, we can find our existence turning into kind of a grim slog through one problem after another. And I bet a lot of us have experienced that. So we might ask ourselves at such a point, where in the chain of the five conditions did I lose touch with reality and get lost in my reaction, interpretation, or my story? Of course, as human beings, we sometimes have to think over a problem that's not happening right now. Maybe our kid's having trouble at school, or maybe we're planning a career change, or maybe we just need to schedule a series of appointments with our dentist. So this capacity to frame reality in our lives, in our minds, as well as simply exist in it, is everything that makes us such wondrous creatures but it's also everything that's both wonderful and terrible about us. We can use this capacity to cure smallpox, or we can use it to create the atom bomb. So the question is, are we choosing our stories, or are they choosing us? We're all marvelous directors of the stories, movies that populate our mind. The question is, do we want to center ourselves in the reality of our moment-to-moment -moment existence, which is nourishing? Look at kids and chipmunks. Or do we want to stay lost in our stories, projections, the movies, and our minds, many of which, sadly, have tragic plots? <laughs> so knowing the difference and being able to choose is the beginning of mindfulness, and that's the beginning of having a more conscious life and helping to build a more conscious world. And it's also the beginning, maybe, of having a few fewer of those bad days. Thank you. <laughs>